20. The Nature of Evil Bond made good progress. When Matisse came to see him three days later, he was propped up in his bed and his arms were free. The lower half of his body was still shrouded in the oblong tent, but he looked cheerful and it was only occasionally that a twinge of pain narrowed his eyes. Matisse looked crestfallen. Here's your check, he said to Bond. I've rather enjoyed walking around with 40 million francs in my pocket, but I suppose you'd better sign it and I'll put it into your account with the Credit Lyonnais. There's no sign of our friend from Smirsch, not a damn trace. He must have got to the villa on foot or on a bicycle, because you heard nothing of his arrival, and the two gunmen obviously didn't. It's pretty exasperating. We've got precious little on this Smirsch organization, and neither is London. Washington said they had, but it turned out to be the usual waffle from refugee interrogation, and you know that's about as much good as interrogating an English man on the street about his own secret service, or a Frenchman about the deuxième. He probably came from Leningrad to Berlin via Warsaw, said Bond. From Berlin they've got plenty of roads open to the rest of Europe. He's back home by now, being told off for not shooting me too. I fancy they've got quite a file on me in view of one or two of the jobs M's given me since the war. He obviously thought he was being smart enough, cutting his initial in my hand. What's that? asked Matthies. The doctor said the cuts look like a square M with a tail to the top. He said they didn't mean anything. Well, I only got a glimpse before I passed out, but I've seen the cuts several times while they were being dressed, and I'm pretty certain they're the Russian letter for shh. It's rather like an inverted M with a tail. That would make sense. Smirsch is a short for Smirchpion M, death to spies, and he thinks he's labeled me as Spion. It's a nuisance because M will probably say I've got to go to hospital again when I get back to London and have new skin grafted over the whole of the back of my hand. It doesn't matter much. I've decided to resign. Matisse looked at him with his mouth open. Resign? he asked incredulously. What the hell for? Bond looked away from Matisse. He studied his bandaged hands. When I was being beaten up, he said, I suddenly liked the idea of being alive. Before Le Chief began, he used a phrase which stuck in my mind. Playing Red Indians. He said that's what I had been doing. Well, I suddenly thought that he might be right. You see, he said, still looking down at his bandages, when one's young, it seems very easy to distinguish between right and wrong. But as one gets older, it becomes more difficult. At school, it's easy to pick out one's own villains and heroes, and one grows up wanting to be a hero and kill the villains. He looked obstinately at Matisse. Well, in the last few years, I've killed two villains. The first was in New York. A Japanese cipher expert cracking our codes on the 36th floor of the RCA building in the Rockefeller Center, where the Japs had their consulate. I took a room on the 40th floor of the next door skyscraper, and I could look across the street into his room and see him working. Then I got a colleague from our organization in New York, and a couple of Remington 3030s with telescopic sights and silencers. We smuggled them up to my room and sat for days waiting for our chance. He shot at the man a second before me. His job was only to blast a hole through the windows so that I could shoot the Jap through it. They have tough windows at the Rockefeller Center to keep the noise out. It worked very well. As I expected, his bullet got deflected by the glass and went God knows where, but I shot immediately after him through the hole he had made. I got the jab in the mouth as he turned to gape at the broken window. Bond smoked for a minute. It was a pretty sound job, nice and clean too. 300 yards away, no personal contact. The next time in Stockholm wasn't so pretty. I had to kill a Norwegian who was doubling against us for the Germans. He'd managed to get two of our men captured, probably bumped off for all I know. For various reasons, it had to be an absolutely silent job. I chose the bedroom of his flat and a knife. And, well, he just didn't die very quickly. For those two jobs, I was awarded a double O number in the service. Felt pretty clever and got a reputation for being good and tough. A double O number in our service means you've had to kill a chap in cold blood in the course of some job. Now, he looked up again at Matisse. That's all very fine. The hero kills two villains. But when the hero Le Chief starts to kill the villain Bond, and the villain Bond knows he isn't a villain at all, you see the other side of the medal. The villains and heroes get all mixed up. Of course, he added as Matisse started to expostulate, patriotism comes along and makes it seem fairly all right. But this country right or wrong business is getting a little out of date. Today we are fighting communism. Okay. If I'd been alive 50 years ago, the brand of conservatism we have today would have been damn near called communism, and we should have been told to go fight that. History is moving pretty quickly along, and the heroes and villains keep changing places. Matisse stared at him aghast. Then he tapped his head and put a calming hand on Bond's arm. You mean to say that this precious Le Chief who did his best to turn you into a eunuch doesn't qualify as a villain? He asked. Anyone would think from the rot you talk that he had been battering against your head instead of your... He gestured down the bed. You wait till M tells you to go after another Le Chief. I bet you'll go after him, all right. And what about Smirsch? I can tell you don't like the idea of these chaps running around France killing anyone they feel has been a traitor to their precious political system. You're a bloody anarchist. He threw his arms in the air and let them fall helplessly to his sides. Bond laughed. All right, he said. Take our friend Le Chief. 
It's simple enough to say he was an evil man. At least, it's simple enough for me, because he did evil things to me. If he was here now, I wouldn't hesitate to kill him, but out of personal revenge and not, I'm afraid, for some high moral reason or for the sake of my country. He looked up at Matisse to see how bored he was getting with these introspective refinements of what, to Matisse, was a simple question of duty. Matisse smiled back at him. Continue, my dear friend. It is interesting for me to see this new bond. Englishmen are so odd. They are like a nest of Chinese boxes. It takes a very long time to get to the center of them. When one gets there, the result is unrewarding, but the process is instructive and entertaining. Continue. Develop your arguments. There may be something I can use to my own chief the next time I want to get out of an unpleasant job. He grinned maliciously. Bond ignored him. Now, in order to tell the difference between good and evil, we have manufactured two images representing the extremes, representing the deepest black and the purest white, and we call them God and the Devil. But in doing so, we have cheated a bit. God is a clear image. You can see every hair on his beard. But the Devil, what does he look like? Bond looked triumphantly at Matisse. Matisse laughed ironically. A woman. It's all very fine, said Bond. But I've been thinking about these things, and I'm wondering whose side I ought to be on. I'm getting very sorry for the devil and his disciples, such as the good Lashif. The devil has a rotten time, and I always like to be on the side of the underdog. We don't give the poor chap a chance. There's a good book about goodness and how to be good and so forth, but there's no evil book about evil and how to be bad. The devil has no prophets to write his Ten Commandments and no team of authors to write his biography. His case has gone completely by default. We know nothing about him but a lot of fairy stories from our parents and schoolmasters. He has no book from which we can learn the nature of evil in all its forms, with parables about evil people, proverbs about evil people, folklore about evil people. All we have is the living example of the people who are at least good, or our own intuition. So, continued Bond, warming to his argument, the chief was serving a wonderful purpose, a really vital purpose, perhaps the best and highest purpose of all. By his evil existence, which foolishly I have helped to destroy, he was creating a norm of badness by which, and by which alone, an opposite norm of goodness could exist. We were privileged in our short knowledge of him to see and estimate his wickedness as we emerge from the acquaintanceship better and more virtuous men. Bravo, said Matisse. I'm very proud of you. You ought to be tortured every day. I really must remember to do something evil this evening. I must start at once. I have a very few marks in my favor. Only small ones, alas, he added ruefully. But I shall work fast now that I have seen the light. What a splendid time I'm going to have. Now, let's see. Where shall I start? Murder? Arson? Rape? But no, these are peccadillies. I really must consult the good Marquis de Sade. I am a child, an absolute child in these matters. His face fell. Ah, but our conscience, my dear Bond. What shall we do with him while we are committing some juicy sin? That is a problem. He is a crafty person, this conscience, and very old. As old as the first family of apes which gave birth to him. We must give that problem really careful thought, or we shall spoil our enjoyment. Of course, we should murder him first. But he is a tough bird. It will be difficult. But if we succeed, we could be worse even than the sheaf. For you, dear James, it is easy. You can start off by resigning. That was a brilliant thought of yours, a splendid start to your new career, and so simple. Everyone has the revolver of resignation in his pocket. All you've got to do is pull the trigger and you will have made a big hole in your country and your conscience at the same time. A murder and a suicide with one bullet. Splendid! What a difficult and glorious profession. As for me, I must start embracing this new cause at once. He looked at his watch. Good, I've started already. I'm half an hour late for a meeting with the chief of police. He rose to his feet laughing. That was most enjoyable, my dear James. You really ought to go on the halls. Now about that little problem of yours, this business of not knowing good men from bad men and villains from heroes and so forth. It is, of course, a difficult problem in the abstract. The secret lies in personal experience, whether you're a Chinaman or an Englishman. He paused at the door. You admit that Le Chief did you personal evil and that you would kill him if he appeared in front of you now. Well, when you get back to London, you will find there are other Le Chiefs seeking to destroy you and your friends and your country, and will tell you about them. And now that you have seen a really evil man, you will know how evil they can be, and you will go after them to destroy them in order to protect yourself and the people you love. You won't wait to argue about it. You know what they look like now, and what they can do to people. You may be a bit more choosy about the jobs you take on, you may want to be certain that the target really is black, but there are plenty of really black targets around. There's still plenty for you to do, and you'll do it. And when you fall in love and have a mistress or a wife and children to look after, it will seem all the easier. Matisse opened the door and stopped on the threshold. Surround yourself with human beings, my dear James. They are easier to fight for than principles. He laughed. But don't let me down and become human yourself. We would lose such a wonderful machine. With a wave of the hand, he shut the door. Hey! shouted Bond. But the footsteps went quickly off down the passage. <laughs>